Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome on this wonderful sunny evening. <clears throat> Last week I saw a young student of mine in the seminar building standing in the front of the lift. He is a climate activist. In passing I called him. Ah, I see. A case of what we call in German Sonntagsmoral. Demonstrating against climate change on the weekend and on Monday using the lift. He blushed and followed me into the stairwell. Today, ecology is one of the most important sources of normative foundations in the morality of everyday life. It seems that we have found a functional equivalent for religion. From the standpoint of sociology of knowledge, we can observe how social movements generalize their ideas. One of the most important elements is the awareness of time, the classification of new terms, the process of making a new epoch. For ecology, it's self-evident to inscribe itself in the natural history. And so, in recent decades, Anthropocene has spread as a new term of the present epoch. Linked to this is the notion that our time is shaped by the fact that man interfered with nature and changed it in a way that is harmful to himself and global life in general. <clears throat> Social movements, if they are successful, are always important for the dynamics of the legal system and with a certain time lag, some people call it the structural conservatism of the legal system, we can observe how jurisprudence and law has changed. Today, Professor Johannes Sauer will present us, I think, five or four important cases from the Western world and South Africa, which shows us the role of courts in connection with the climate change movement and climate politics. Professor Sauer is a fellow at the Käthe Hamburger Kolleg, Law as Culture. He studied law at the University of Tübingen and Yale University. He received his doctorate degree with the piece Die Funktionen der Rechtsverordnung at the University of Bayreuth, where he had employed since 2002 as a research associate in connection with Oliver Lepsius, son of the well-known German sociologist Rainer M. Lepsius. M is for Maria. He took his Master of Law from Yale University in 2008. So he subsequently um, worked as academic director in Bayreuth and received his habilitation there in public law, European law and legal philosophy. Subsequent, um, Professor Sauer held his interim professorship in Berlin, Gießen and Bielefeld. Then he accepted a university professorship at Bielefeld University since 2040. Johannes Sauer has served as professor of public law, environmental law, infrastructure law and comparative law at the University of Tübingen. Professor Sauer, I'm glad to welcome you at the center, and now it's your turn. So, thank you, Professor Albrecht, for your kind introduction. Dear colleagues and friends, guests, thank you for joining us uh, today. It's my great pleasure, and I'm very honored to be here at the KT Hamburger Kolleg for this semester a wonderful institution for research and inspiring discourses. My lecture today, Climate Change Mitigation in the Anthropocene, proceeds in five parts. Part one introduces the concept of the Anthropocene as a new interdisciplinary paradigm in thinking about where we are in Earth history. Part two turns 
to the role of law at the various levels of international governance, part three on implementation and the turn to the courts, part four on five climate change cases across the globe, and part five with cross-cutting perspectives and conclusions. <coughs> Let me start with an iconic image, iconic in the history of human conceptions of the Earth. In relation to Earth history, this photo was taken not even yesterday, only 50 years ago in 1968 by NASA astronauts of the Apollo 8 mission to the Moon. It shows Earth rise behind the Moon in just the way that is familiar to us when the Moon rises over the Earth. It maybe is the first color photo of planet Earth in its position in the universe ever, and against a plain black horizon. The imaginative and ethical force of this image, vulnerability, unity, responsibility, singularity in space, maybe, carried much of the emerging environmental law and policy in the early 1970s. But, retrospectively, the 70s are not a turning point in humanity's approach to the environment. Rather, they occur as part of the so-called Great Acceleration, a tremendous increase in resource consumption over the course of the second half of the 20th century. The imprint on planet Earth increased and became ever more visible. These graphs here give statistical proof. On the x-axis of these graphs there are centuries, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, and in the second half of the 20th century steep increases. Population on Earth almost tripled, this is the graph on the top, energy consumption primarily from fossil fuels, the graph in the middle, increased by at least factor 5. In the transportation sector, graph on the bottom, an even steeper increase in the global number of cars. There are lots of other examples for increases like that. Water use, fertilizer consumption, international tourism, loss of biodiversity, species extinction rise in atmospheric CO2 concentration. Earth sciences have structured thousands of millions of years of Earth history along various eras, periods and epochs. The Quaternary period and in it the Pleistocene epoch, for example. In each phase the climate was very different follow-up of ice ages and warm ages, and the Earth was inhabited by very different species. The epoch associated with human activity and culture is called the Holocene. It began after the last ice age about 12,000 years ago. Climate-wise, the Holocene has remarkably stable conditions that enabled the emergence and spread of humanity across the globe. Then, after the year 2000, the notion of the Anthropocene emerged to indicate a new epoch in Earth history and as a key term of interdisciplinary research. Geologists, chemists like Paul Crutzen cited here in the first dash, physicists, sociologists and philosophers trace and measure the imprint of humankind on nature. They conclude that humanity has become a decisive geological factor and shapes nature just as much as the forces of nature themselves. Thus, as a leading group of scholars puts it, the Earth has been pushed out of the Holocene epoch by human activities into the Anthropocene as a new geological epoch in Earth history. Or, in the words of others, the Anthropocene marks our current geological epoch, beginning mid-20th century 
in which humans are the primary cause of permanent planetary change. Thus, the new chapter in Earth history was in its basic terminology created out of the Greek words anthropos for human and kainos for new. Bruno Latour, French sociologist and a preeminent thinker on the Anthropocene, draws on the theory of Gaia, developed by James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis in the 1970s. He conceives of the Earth, and more precisely the biosphere, as a dynamic living organism that is supposed to react to the destructive force of human intrusion with a shift of geological conditions beyond human capabilities. In contemporary art, the Anthropocene is also reflected. One approach is to ask, where will we be? A utopian or dystopian approach. For example, in this art project at display in Lisbon, Portugal and elsewhere, which is titled Eco-Visionaries, Art Architecture and New Media after the Anthropocene. The exhibition poster here in the background shows one of the artworks called The Green Machine by Stefan Malka. I take it to show, on the one hand, a landscape lost to desertification, and on the other, a giant artificial construction moving forward from the back of the picture supposed to adjust humanity to the new conditions. <coughs> it generates solar energy, provides space for people to live and industries and services to operate, and moreover fertilizes formerly dry ground. A kind of perpetuum mobile, we may say, for the 22nd or maybe already for the 21st century. A second approach in the arts is to ask, where are we already? It is predominant, for example, in this project, simply called the Anthropocene Project, by a collective of photographers and filmmakers. It centers around aerial photographs of vast industrialized landscapes that construct and interpret domestication and alteration of nature like this one here. A prototypical western big city suburban settlement, kilometers of single home housing and transportation infrastructure. But there is also here in the middle below deforestation of rainforest for soya bean plantation in Malaysia or in the middle on top, lithium mining in the Atacama Desert in Bolivia. Or last but not least, on the right side, an example from Germany. Taken not too far from here, maybe 100 kilometers only to the northwest, a brown coal mining site in North Rhine-Westphalia. These images to my understanding, introduce the Anthropocene as an epoch of economic activity, of technological change, of changes in energy generation, and of environmental crisis. These two approaches in the arts, where will we be and where are we already, are of course also how we can think about law. The notion of the Anthropocene, it should be said, raises a variety of critiques. Within the geosciences, critics miss a sufficient distinction from the preceding Earth period. In the humanities, the concept is criticized for blurring responsibilities of industrialized countries, of beneficiaries of globalization, and of unjust economic structures. Others disagree with the perceived naive optimism in humanity's technological options 
to master the crisis, for example through geoengineering. These critiques certainly have their points. However, I still think that the notion of the Anthropocene covers as good as no other the depth and breadth of the ecological changes of our time. The dawn of the Anthropocene signals tremendous environmental harm. Harm for ecosystems, organisms, species, animals, trees, as such, but also harm for the environment as the basic <coughs> condition of human living. Thus, the Anthropocene also poses a tremendous challenge to law. If you look at the map of the world here in this slide, we see significant differences to the image of Earthrise on the very first slide today. Now we see the contours of states that are also the contours of law. Because we still live to a large extent in the Westphalian order in which individual states are the basic level of legitimacy and organization of legal processes. Nevertheless, in modernity, in the post-war order after 1949, law has developed into the key medium to resolve common problems of mankind. Examples of international law as an emerging public legal order include the UN Charter, the Law of the Sea and of Antarctica, the creation of international courts and regional treaty cooperation in Europe or South America. Regards the environmental consequences of the Anthropocene, it is particularly clear that they demand for global legal solutions. Since the 1970s, a broad body of international environmental law has emerged that includes, for example, international conventions on biodiversity protection or the regional environmental law of the Aarhus Convention. The perils of rising greenhouse gas emissions and global warming were first addressed in the early 1990s in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, later in the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement of 2015. In the Paris Agreement, almost 200 states aim to, quote-unquote, hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. They commit to broad decarbonization and global CO2 neutrality of economy and society by the end of the 21st century. On the regional level, the European Union has been the globally most ambitious supranational institution with robust climate change legislation. And on the national level, states deliver nationally determined contributions that may include domestic reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, but also support projects in other countries. In only very few countries, the policy goals articulated in climate change mitigation policies are completely implemented in legally binding rules. However, in almost all societies, there is growing concern about climate change and growing pressure on national governments to step up climate change efforts. A recent and very visible phenomenon is, of course, the Fridays for Future movement. Against this backdrop, across the globe, more and more private individuals, non-profit organizations and businesses are turning to the courts. In only a few years, climate change litigation has developed into a global phenomenon. On every continent, there are numerous climate change cases, certainly several hundred worldwide. However, Courts at the international or supranational level, like the International Court of Justice or the Regional Human Rights Courts, so far only play a minor role. A consequence of the lack of adequate legal mechanisms at the global level. Rather, plaintiffs address courts on the national level, exploring legal options for protection against negative effects of climate change in the presence and precaution 
against risks and dangers in the future. Out of several hundred cases, I will look on five cases more in detail. The first case concerns the state of Massachusetts at the American East Coast, one of the first climate change cases that received worldwide attention. As we see from the picture of Boston here, directly at the shoreline, the state is particularly vulnerable to rising sea levels. In the early 2000s, in the era of President George W. Bush, a legal dispute emerged on the obligation of the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, to regulate CO2 emissions from motor car traffic. The relevant section of the U.S. Clean Air Act entitled the agency to regulate standards applicable to the emission of any air pollutant from new motor vehicles which cause or contribute to air pollution which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. EPA denied to have authority for such a regulation and argued that even if it had, it was unwise to act. The state of Massachusetts challenged the EPA and pointed to the perils of rising sea levels for its coastal cities and shorelines. The US Supreme Court sided with Massachusetts with a narrow margin of five to four votes. First, the court granted standing. Following existing case law, the majority held that, quote unquote, EPA's steadfast refusal to regulate greenhouse gas emissions presents a risk of harm to Massachusetts that is both actual and imminent. The requirement of potential judicial relief was met with regard to EPA's capacity to regulate only identified risk. Second, the court interpreted the legal term air pollutant to embrace all airborne compounds of whatever stripe and thus to include CO2 emissions. Third, it held that the agency's refusal to act was arbitrary and capricious. However, the four justice of the minority issued dissenting opinions. They denied standing and accepted EPA's view that it was unwise to act. In terms of legal culture, the case is particularly interesting for its emphasis on an active role of justices in light of ecological challenges that are relatively new to the century-old constitutional order of the US. It also reflects the phenomenon of congressional gridlock, a virtual standstill of the legislative machinery. The inability to reach compromise in an era of increased political polarization. The number of enacted federal statutes in the US has declined significantly during the 1980s, 90s and 2000s. Environmental law is hit particularly hard. As a consequence, the presidential executive, federal agencies and the courts are, to one extent or another, stepping up to fill the substantial gap and deal with historically new phenomena that require answers by the regulatory machine of the modern state. The second case is the arguably most prominent climate change case in Europe. It happens in the Netherlands, which in itself is interesting because the Dutch geography is extraordinarily impacted by changing sea levels, even long before the awareness of climate change. More than 25% of the country lie below sea level. Large parts of the polar landscape, industrial areas, agriculture, estates, for tourism, are artificially remade and preserved by dikes and seawalls against storm flooding and other dangers from the North Sea. Thus, the Dutch example illustrates the interdependence of economy and ecology in the Anthropocene. Several years ago, the Dutch environmental NGO Urgenda 
a word combination out of urgent and agenda, filed a lawsuit against the national government to implement significantly stricter national greenhouse gas mitigation goals. The case was filed in first instance with the district court at the seat of the national government in The Hague. That was because the Netherlands are one of the few European countries that have never established a constitutional court. In 2015, the district court fully agreed with Ohenda and ordered the Dutch government to reduce greenhouse gas emissions until 2020 significantly. This judgment was immediately a world sensation, not only in legal spheres, but also in mainstream media. Three years later, the court of second instance upheld the judgment. The reasoning, however, shifted significantly. The first instance had relied on Dutch tort law, arguing that the national government had neglected its duty of care vis-à-vis -vis the citizens and future generations. The second instance, however, relied on the European Convention of Human Rights and a duty to protect rights to physical integrity and privacy of current and future generations from the consequences of climate change. Important aspects of legal culture that may have influenced these decisions are a long tradition of openness of Dutch law towards international law, the strong procedural role for non-governmental organizations in the Dutch law of civil procedure, and a long-term broad and transparent drafting process for a national climate change statute. It followed the consensus-oriented tradition of the so-called polder democracy and included a multitude of stakeholders from politics, economy and society. Currently, another appeal of the Dutch government to the third and final instance is pending. The third case takes us to Germany and to the civil law courts. The defendant here is RWE, the largest German energy company. RWE owns and operates a large number of power plants based on carbon fuels, such as this one here in the picture below. In global perspective, RWE is among the private companies with the largest record of CO2 emissions. The so-called Carbon Majors Report by an environmental non-profit organization in 2017 claims that RWE in the last three decades has emitted a share of 0.47% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The plaintiff, Saul Luciano Luya, is a citizen of Peru. He owns property and farmland in the Peruvian Andes in the region of Huaraz, which is why the case is also known as the Huaraz case. The plaintiff's property is located underneath a glacier lake similar to the landscape visible in the picture on top. He argues that due to anthropogenic global warming, glaciers are melting and the volume of the glacier lake is constantly increasing. Moreover, he argues, the glacier lake may break the dams one day and may flood and damage his home and property. So the plaintiff, with support of a non-profit organization from Germany, seeks financial compensation for protection measures against the risk of overflooding or landslides caused by the breaking <coughs> dam of the glacier lake. He argues that RWE is responsible for potential damage to the extent of 0.47%, proportionate to the scale of its historic CO2 emissions identified in the Carbon Major Report. As a legal basis, the plaintiff invokes the claim to reverse a disturbance of property under paragraph 1004 of the German Civil Code. From these facts and claims, difficult questions of civil liability arise. How can the causality of emissions of a single emitter for climate change damages be determined? How does the principle of conditio sine qua non and the theory of adequate causation play out? <coughs> 
does a case of cumulative emissions with millions or even billions of emitters hinder the attribution of impairments to individual causers? In the case of damages in consequence of glacier melting different from damages resulting from heat waves or wildfires, does the existence of a legally valid emission permit exempt the power plant from liability? The Regional Court of Essen, at the seat of the headquarters of RWE, as court of first instance, rejected the claim on grounds of insufficiently proved causality. The appeals court, Higher Regional Court Hamm, however, took a different stance and approved of the plaintiff's line of argument and ordered to hear expert opinions on the factual key aspects of the claim. This is where the case stands right now. In terms of legal culture, it's interesting that the German climate change case, with the broadest public attention so far, is not a public law case, for the Bundesverfassungsgericht, for example, but a private law case. There is also the significance of historical material from the time of the framing of the BGB around 1900, and the growing importance of strategic litigation that traditionally plays only a minor role in German legal culture. Case number four comes from Austria. It poses the question of consequences of climate change law for infrastructure. Vienna Airport, which we see in this picture, is the largest airport of the country, as air travel is a growing market across Europe and worldwide. The airport intends to increase transportation capacities. The Austrian authorities granted permission for a third runway. The permission was challenged, though, by several plaintiffs, including environmental NGOs, noise-affected neighbors, and the city of Vienna. The key legal question relates to the statutory basis for the permission of civil airfields. In the Austrian Aviation Act, the most important conditions for such a permit are technical suitability and safe operation, an unmet need, the construction of the airfield is in the public interest, and other public interests do not oppose. Is the third runway in the public interest, then? The Federal Administrative Court, as court of first instance, surprisingly sided with the plaintiffs. The court found that the negative climate effects of increased CO2 emissions outweighed the economic benefits and decided the permit was illegal. However, the Federal Constitutional Court reversed the judgment. It held that climate change was not a relevant public interest under the Austrian Aviation Act and had unlawfully informed the first instance. In terms of legal culture, we may note that first the struggle between the judicial instances happened against the backdrop of a very recent reform of the Austrian administrative court system so that the legal community still had to work out standards of review. And second, that the reasoning of the Constitutional Court seems to express a particularly legalistic or formalistic approach to legal interpretation that has traditionally been associated with this court in <coughs> comparative legal literature. The fifth case takes us back to the American continent, a case of the Supreme Court of Colombia. Climate change law and policy play out differently in Colombia compared to the four cases before. The industrial CO2 emissions of Colombia, although the third largest country in South America with 50 million people, are relatively small. However, Colombia is home to the upper part of the river Amazon and the Amazon rainforest, a huge deposit of greenhouse gases and regulator to the global climate. 
Thus, the facet of the Anthropocene that appears here is changing landscapes by deforestation, vast changes in land use, altering the local climate, but also the biosphere through release of sequestrated greenhouse gas emissions. In the Paris Agreement, Colombia committed to stop deforestation. However, there are obvious difficulties in implementation. Thus, about two dozen children and young adults brought a lawsuit to effectively stop deforestation and its causes, such as illegal mining. The Colombian Supreme Court decided in their favor. It ordered the relevant authorities to counteract the deforestation rate in the Amazon, to conclude an intergenerational pact for the life of the Colombian Amazon, and issue land management plans, including climate change adaptation measures. The reasoning is impressive in both its factual and normative assumptions of causes and consequences of climate change risks in Colombia and the world. In legal terms, the court draws on fundamental rights, constitutional environmental principles, the notion of intergenerational equity, the environmental rights of future generations, recognition of the River Amazon as a subject of rights, the nature of international environmental law as a global ecological public order, and the obligations of Colombia under international environmental law and climate change law. There is a particularly critical narrative underlying the judgment that challenges the globally prevailing order of market economies. The court explicitly criticizes, quote-unquote, the hegemonic planetary position that humankind has taken to the adoption of an anthropocentric and selfish model that is characterized by harmful traits for environmental stability and, moreover, the unmeasurable demographic growth, the adoption of a vertiginous development system that is guided by consumerism and the current political economic systems and the excessive exploitation of natural resources. This is, of course, taken from an English translation. Moreover, the judgment holds a quasi-constitutional view on international environmental law that is explicitly invoked as a global ecological public order. It follows the tradition of constitutional judicial activism shaped by the Constitutional Court of Colombia, which the Supreme Court adopted. <clears throat> Looking at these five cases all together, we can identify several recurring themes. An overarching set of problems that shapes the role of courts in climate change litigation questions and tasks that all judges confront. First, climate change courts are navigating novel legal landscapes. Just as the Anthropocene expresses a new understanding of space and time, courts are confronted with unprecedented factual arguments and normative claims. Navigating unknown territories is a challenge and opportunity to a particularly innovative quality of judgment, and may also explain some of the stark contrasts between first and second instances that we saw regards reasoning or results. Second, and relatedly, courts in climate change cases have to reconsider the spectrum of rights and obligations, including future generations. The question at stake can be very different, depending on the case. It may concern standing rights of a single federal state or of non-governmental organizations, the scope of regional human rights treaties, human rights of future generations, or the climate change obligations of energy companies. Third, courts are confronted with collective action problems. In the pursuit of a common goal, such as the avoidance of devastating consequences of climate change, private individuals 
but also individual countries tend to seek free riding options and leave the cost of action to others. Thus, courts have to decide and give reasons whether or not it's up to their legal community to take on social and economic burdens that may not stand in reciprocity to those of others. Fourth, all cases reflect an inherent tension between courts and political branches. This is the eternal question of the role of courts in a democratic separation of power system with constitutionalized human rights. Courts that articulate substantial requirements of climate change actions face criticism for transgressing into the competences of executive and legislature or even constitutional assemblies and are accused of departing from required judicial self-restraint. However, advocates of a more dynamic court reasoning may have good counter-arguments and point to an institutional duty of courts to guarantee and enforce climate change-related implications of human rights and constitutional principles of state action. This is the line of argument we saw in the Dutch Ochenda reasoning in the Austrian Court of First Instance and also in the Colombian Supreme Court. Fifth and finally, we see a dynamic impact of legal cultures. The reasoning of the US Supreme Court in its majority decision upon standing for Massachusetts and the coverage of greenhouse gas emissions by the Clean Air Act is a perfect example for a culture of dynamic constitutional and statutory interpretation to adjust and to modernize older layers of law as effective tools to approach the environmental perils of the day. But strong dissenting opinions hold sharply antagonistic views, urging for judicial self-restraint and historical restraints on state functions. This indicates that the prevailing cultural influences can change over time and reflects the dynamic nature of legal cultures. In Austria, the Constitutional Court's reasoning on the case of the Third Runway reflects a formalistic legal tradition, whereas the reasoning of the harshly rebuffed First Instance Court hints to the avenues for a changing legal culture under EU and ECHR influences. In the Netherlands, finally, the Ochenda decisions are expression of a legal culture that formally has no constitutional review of legislation, but is already used to functional equivalence in the context of national Dutch legislation that was measured against individual rights in EU law and under the ECHR. So, thank you. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion.